to say that um, NYT is interested to help um, expanding, I would say, what I call the creative tech tribe. And so um, this year we started, as she said, the, uh, or Isabel said, the, the Creative Tech Innovation Council. And with that, we also want to build maybe um, a, a wider, broader pipeline. So we don't have the high school students here, but uh, we actually engaged uh, the Teen Hex Ally that we was uh, was spoken about yesterday from Long Island. It's a coder club. Um, so really, high school kids <laughs> took a large part on. Then we have our university college uh, students uh, from various disciplines. And then, of course, the uh, professionals and industries. So I think that's interesting to kind of start very low on the high school level and actually bring them on to those projects and actually expand even the scope of those projects. I think sustainability would be interesting for us for uh, in creative tech, health, yeah, and also um, I think supporting people with disabilities. I think there's a huge potential and we saw, we saw yesterday a couple of uh, presentations that actually go in that direction and I think that could be uh, one part of that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to say a few words because over the past five weeks, it has been my pleasure um, to be the workshop leader for this really fantastic team of students from the NYIT Creative Tech Club plus administration, Dean Pongratz, and members of the Creative Tech Week community. And I'd like to introduce you to some of those people, uh, members of the team, from the Rescue Raspberry team. And um, what that is, it's a mesh network prototype for disaster relief. So they all, Alexis O'Rourke, um, Alexander Savietz, and Daniel Jung, as well as Bashuli Deb here, and then of course, the indefatigable Isabel Walcott Draves and Dean Pongratz have all been working together with other students who couldn't attend today. And they're going to be letting you know more about this amazing project in this presentation. Now first, Isabel, we have a slide. We just want you to talk a little bit about the council. So we started with a brainstorming presentation. And uh, I believe we've got audio here. Um, that's Luke Schantz from IBM, and there's our Daria. They made a, a prototype out of paper and uh, some pipe cleaner. So this was a couple of hours uh, on, a, on a Tuesday night, and we had four brainstorming groups. Uh, this was one of them, and um, this was the one that got selected um, to become a prototype. So for the past six weeks, we'll share with you what we've done. What they've done, I should <laughs> say. I'm Bashuli Deb, and I'm a faculty at Rutgers, New Brunswick. Um, so a natural disaster has hit a local community in Brooklyn. The Salazars have immediate information needs about their family members in this emergency. Brianna is at a play date in the neighborhood and Kevin is at school. Dad is home at the basement of the family apartment and mom is working at the cash register at the car wash nearby. They are all still in close proximity to each other. These people may be undocumented and so would be afraid of reaching out to authorities, but they have access to our device. 
Hi, my name is Alexis O'Rourke. I am a sophomore architecture student at NYIT, um, and I'm concentrating in construction management as well as taking a business minor. Uh, I'm the secretary of this club, and I'm also the president and founder of Music Club. Um, so our task here was to create the Mesh Net Network, uh, as you saw in the video. Uh, and we're going to kind of talk about the technical side as well as the design side and how we'd uh, get that device to you. Uh, so our basic idea here is to connect your device with family members as well as first responders in an emergency situation where the Wi-Fi or cell service may be down. Uh, this idea is very similar to that of a walkie-talkie. We took the Raspberry Pi, which you can see up there, uh, and we coded it with Python to make a simple connection between two devices. Once the device was able to speak with one another over the network, we added the third device. That third device is what created the mesh network. Uh, it strengthened the connection between all of the devices, so in this case, device one and two, as well as made the network expandable. Uh, this modular network is where you are able to change devices as long as they are programmed to the network itself. So you may be asking yourself, what is a mesh network? Well, I didn't know either when I started this. So there was a lot of research involved. Again, I'm an architect. This is all new to me. So the mesh network was a local network where the infrastructure nodes, so the bridges and switches, everything that goes into the network, connected directly and constantly without being divided into the different levels. So you could see that in the third and fourth image there, labeled mesh. Uh, the network can be connected to as many other nodes as possible and cooperate with one another, another to transfer data to and from the clients, which in this case was the Raspberry Pi that you saw on the last slide. Uh, due to the non-hierarchical state of the network, each node was able to relay information. The network is able to organize and configure itself, allowing for dynamic distribution of the workloads even in the event of a node failure. The mesh network is therefore fault tolerant, which reduces the overall maintenance cost. This is extremely important because during an emergency situation, maintenance may not be available. <coughs> uh, so a more conventional local network, which we see every day, uh, would be what we call the star tree formation, which is the first and second one. <coughs> so in the star tree formation, the infrastructure of the network is hierarchical, uh, which means that there, like, there's one thing that controls everything, pretty much. And if that one thing goes out, then there is no network possible. So again, there's fault involved. In that case, uh, it's not as reliable as the net mesh network that we created. And also, we would encrypt the mesh network to have better antennas to help the range between the devices, making the mesh network the main thing that we would want, pretty much, in the emergency situation. Uh, so the communication in the mesh tree is between the each pie that we would create and the balloon signal, which you saw in the video, would strengthen the network again between the pies and would act as a router. Uh, in a more advanced version of the prototype, so what we would go forward with next, um, we would connect any IoT device to the network. So IoT is the Internet of Things and refers to a network of physical objects that have any IP address in order to connect to the Internet. Any Raspberry Pi, smartphone, or even the refrigerator in this case, if it's an IoT device, could communicate with another device connected to the same network. Hello, my name is Alexander Savias. I'm an aerospace engineer major, and uh, so today we'll be speaking about the Raspberry Pis. So we started off by just taking a simple Raspberry Pi and connecting it with an NRF24L01 uh, transmitter. It's a radio transmitter, so this all relies heavily on radio frequencies. Uh, it's a very simple connection. Then all you need to do is do a little bit of programming with Python, use some uh, open source libraries, and pretty much just change them up to your desire. Uh, once this is created, we uh, we can engage them and put them out throughout the community. They have a range of up to a thousand meters, which we'll show a video in the next slide. It'll show that it reaches enough from house to house if you just go into a regular uh, sur suburban neighborhood. <coughs> well, in the future, like Alexis mentioned, we would like to add a messaging GUI, a graphical user interface, in order to actually be able to communicate and make it simple for people. So they would connect with Bluetooth to the device and be able to have an application which is just like your regular messaging application where you can pick a contact who you like, who you like to send it to, write the message and press send. So the video is just a very simple uh, concept showing that we can receive a message from a distance we came up with the innovative name Rescue Raspberries because this will be handed out to mostly schools and school children to bring back to their families. And it's just a name that uh, I guess would work well with kids. 
Uh, the final product, we aim to make water resistant, maybe buoyant possibly, in case there's flooding in this area, such as Long Island. Uh, definitely battery powered with a long lasting battery so that we don't have to worry about if there's no electricity for people. The Salazar family's daughter, Brianna, is young and tech savvy. She received a disaster preparedness kit at school called Rescue Raspberry. In it was included a Raspberry Pi, which connects the family and the neighborhood to the mesh network. The kids and parents were trained how to operate the devices so that they are prepared. They now have an alternative way to send signals to the community. This enables them to, one, alleviate fear. Now they can contact family and learn they are all safe. Two, they can come up with a plan of getting to a safe place together. Three, they can help neighbors to a safe place and get them what they need. So currently, uh, the prototype is it's only in its initial phases. Uh, ideally, we would like to have the mesh network be accessible through, like Alexander said, a simplistic user-friendly device such as a cell phone. Uh, we have successfully made the mesh connection between the Raspberry Pi, so half the battle is over. Our next step would be able to make the mesh network accessible to the devices by creating an app with a messenger inf interface <coughs> that would be accessible to Android and iOS devices. This app could be downloaded to your cell device and be capable of sending very basic emergency messages without the Wi-Fi or cell service available. With that being said, the estimated time until the product could be released on the market would be roughly six months. In that time, we'd be able to create a user-friendly interface as well as run final testing to debug any initial issues we encounter. After the initial release of the product, we estimate that regular updates will occur every two to three days to ensure the most recent data transfer is available. This device will be community-based, so each zoning area would be have its own individual secure network, so the balloon. At this point in the project, we would like to ask for your support. Uh, hopefully, that we can get it through outsourcing advertisement as well as financially in order to help kickstart us and move it forward with the app and everything else. So thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with you.